I'm talking today with Dr Georgie Paxton, who is the Head of Immigrant Health here at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne. Thank you, Georgie, for your time. Thank you. Uh, you've written uh, an article for the MJA on the no jab, no pay legislation and its, its consequences for immigrant families and children. Tell me a little bit about the legislation to start with and then what the consequences have been for immigrant children and refugee children. Um, sure. So the No Jab, No Pay Act is an amendment to the social services legislation. Yep. It was passed last November and came into effect from January of this year. And it was intended to close the conscientious subjection exemption to immunisation requirements for family assistance, payment, family assistance payments. So the intentions were really around reinforcing the importance of immunisation and protecting public health and that was acknowledged when this was raised as a bill. Um, the issue arising is, however, certainly from our perspective clinically, the impact for kids who arrived here after the age of seven. Right. Basically, what has happened is the legislation requires kids to be up to date with their early childhood vaccinations in order to qualify for those yes. family assistance payments and recognising that these family assistance payments apply not only to early childhood but to kids who are school age yeah. and also right up to the age of 20 years in the case of the family tax benefit part A end of year supplement. Yes. The legislation requires all kids to be up to date with their early childhood vaccinations in yeah. order to qualify for these family assistance payments. Right. Now the way that immunisation is measured is using the Australian Childhood Immunisation Register. Yep. Um, understanding that that was expanded from the start of this year up to 20 years and now currently is expanded across the lifespan. Right. Immunisation status is measured by whether you're registered or recorded as up to date on mm -hmm. PESA. The difficulty is that prior to this year you could only put vaccination information onto ASA for kids aged under seven years. So anyone who arrived okay. in Australia after the age of seven years or anyone who arrived and had catch-up vaccinations after the age of seven years won't be recorded as up-to-date on ASA because we couldn't put that information in. Okay, and the consequence of that is that now everybody's trying to catch up with a lack of documentation. Well, they may have actually completed their catch-up immunisation after arrival, right. but that's not recorded on ASA, which is the instrument used to measure immunisation status. Okay, so is that resulting in a whole bunch of duplication and a lot of documentation that doesn't need to be done? Look, on the ground, what we've seen is that families have been sent letters from Centrelink, yep. often multiple letters from Centrelink, requesting that they clarify their immunisation status. And families have needed to seek out providers to try and clarify their past vaccinations, mm -hmm. determine whether they need additional catch-up vaccinations now and then obtain those vaccinations and get all of that background history and their current status recorded on the immunisation register. All of that takes time yeah. and has put pressure on the workforce working in immunisation. Particularly GPs, I would imagine. Particular GPs. Victoria is somewhat different to the other jurisdictions in that we have quite a high proportion of our immunisations, particularly those in early childhood, delivered through our local government areas. Yep. So there are pressures in all parts of the service system, in primary care, in community health, in the local government area immunisation services. Okay. Is there an easy fix? Um, there's no immediate easy fix. Yeah. The bottom line is people need to clarify what's happened before, yeah. figure out if they need catch up, get their catch up vaccinations if they're outstanding and put all of that onto ASAP. But the difficulty is, is we're often chasing a history from some years previously, it may be a decade previously. Yeah. And even for children seen within our own service, it's actually pretty difficult to track down the exact immunisations given many years previously. The other complexity here is that when families first arrive in Australia, they're often actually mobile and they may change providers in the early settlement period or down the track. Yeah. And it's pretty hard to keep track of records. Yeah. I think that's the case for all of us. I don't think that's particular migrant families. We don't always do a great job of giving families clear documentation at the time. The immigrant families are actually quite pro-vaccination, is yeah. that? What's, what's the reason for that? Um, it's an interest, I'm speaking based on our own clinical experience, but mm -hmm. I've worked in this area for more than a decade. We have around a thousand attendances a year at the hospital service, but probably 1,500 attendances a year across our broader outreach clinics. Yeah. And in 10 years, I've never actually had any family decline vaccination. Families are really keen to sort out their immunisation status in Australia, 
I think that comes through having greater experience of disruptive health systems, having seen vaccine preventable diseases. Yeah. And in many ways, these families are actually very much informed about what these conditions look like, whereas sometimes I think we may have lost sight of that in Australia. It's important to highlight the complexity of giving catch-up immunisation or vaccinations to these kids and families. Yeah. When we talk about catch-up immunisation for an Australian-born child, it might be that they've missed one point in the Australian immunisation schedule. They've missed their four-year-old vaccines, yep. and it's a pretty straightforward manner to give them the vaccinations that are due at that time. When we're completing catch-up vaccinations for refugee background families, there's a much greater deal of complexity. So, firstly, immunisation is only one part of the post-arrival refugee health assessment, and yep. we're doing comprehensive health assessments and also working through pre-arrival history, what settlement's looking like, what supports are in place, and all of this is actually completed with the assistance of the interpreter. So, the post-arrival stage is busy already. Calculating a catch-up schedule is complex. You've got to factor in what's happened overseas, what might have happened as part of migration screening, what else is coming from the health screening results and any other vaccinations given in Australia. So you've got to develop a schedule. And then what you're effectively doing is giving multiple vaccines to multiple family members at ages that are outside the standard Australian schedule points. Yeah. And you're doing all of that in the middle of all of this other healthcare. Providers find it difficult, we find it difficult. We've yes. been doing this a long time. Yeah. And it's difficult to, I guess, overemphasise the multiple factors you need to consider in this setting. We know that um, no one effectively will arrive fully immunised by the Australian yeah. schedule and that's because country of origin schedules are different, there are different vaccinations and forced migration is associated with disruption of health systems and often immunisation programs. Yeah. So everyone needs catch up immunisation when they arrive. Most people don't have written records in which case our Australian guidelines recommend full catch up yeah. And we're actually talking three to four sets of vaccines and three sets over at least four months for kids who are younger, they'll need four or more sets. And it takes time. Yeah. It's not only starting catch-up immunisation, it's actually completing catch-up immunisation that's important. If you had a magic wand and you were writing this kind of legislation, what would you have done differently? <laughs> um, probably the most straightforward um, way to... I guess reduce this complexity would have been to apply the legislation prospectively. So to children born 2009 or later, so they were aged under seven and they'd had a chance for their vaccinations to be registered on ASA. That would have circumvented a lot of the issues arising. Yeah. Given that legislative change takes a period of time, probably I think there is a really good case to delay people Centrelink payments being reduced on the basis of the immunisation status not being up to date and that gives them adequate time to clarify their immunisation status, yep. get catch up vaccinations and also get all of this registered and recorded on the ACAR. I think there's been really significant implications for the immunisation register yep. and it's exposed a number of systems issues around that because information was also taking a really long time to be recorded on the ASAP because I think there's been very significantly increased demand and yeah. recording of vaccination. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I think the plus of all of this is the fact that so many families have sought out providers in this regard actually is very much in keeping with our clinical experience that these families are supportive of immunisation. And many people have been really proactive about trying to get this sorted out. Um, it is a phenomenal opportunity to improve coverage in Australia. Yeah. And I think the expansion of the immunisation register is an amazing opportunity for us as a country to have uh, a deeper understanding of our immunisation coverage. Thank you for your time. No worries.